good morning, everyone. And it's not as bad as it was yesterday. That's the only thing I can really say about the weather. But I'm so glad to see you. My name is Jane Osgathar. I'm president of the Vermont Alliance for Retired Americans. And um, like most of us, we are very concerned about what this November election means on the Congress and on the state legislature. So that's why we were able to have George Twigg, who's the Vermont director for Peter Welch, and David Zuckerman, who is our lieutenant governor, and he is just re-elected, which is really great. Yes. And these two gentlemen will give us, this is their impressions. This is not something set in stone, but um, they certainly are savvy, <laughs> putting it mildly. George has been Peter uh, Welch's Vermont director for about almost four years now. And David, of course, has a long and illustrious history in the state legislature, first as a rep, and then as a senator, and now as lieutenant governor. And we hope someday soon, <laughs> yes, that yes. he might be in a, another higher position. But that is to come. <laughs> and we don't even know if he wants to do that. <laughs> but but <laughs> we're hoping. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you've ever been to a rally or anything like that with David, he usually gives everybody carrots. And I want to say that they are some of the best carrots I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to fool around. This will be audience participation. You'll hear what they are saying. If you have questions, if you have thoughts you want to add, go right ahead. It's encouraged. Um, what Jill, else? Did you want to introduce Jill? Oh, Jill, I didn't know she was back there. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> And we have, we have a representative, one of the representatives, there's going to be another one later, from the Vermont House of Representatives. Jill presents Kerensky, sorry Jill, uh, is the House Majority Leader, and she's on I forgot the committee. Transportation. Transportation, Transportation yeah. which is very important to seniors as well as anybody else who hasn't got a car. And that's really tricky mm -hmm. around here. <coughs> so Jill is there too. And um, there is one thing I want to say before our, we get into the real political discussion. Because a lot of people really have absolutely no idea who or what the Alliance for Retired Americans are. And what I want you to know is we are a progressive liberal group affiliated with the F, uh, CIO. <laughs> it's affiliated with labor. And, and um, we, they have their Washington office, their chapters in most all the states, and we really advocate for, obviously, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the programs that, the national programs that are helping seniors and other people who are of low income, who may be physically, uh, physically or mentally handicapped in some way, that's what we do. And obviously, for the last few years in Washington, that's been an uphill battle. But <clears throat> they're also of the chapters, the state chapters, we concentrate on our state. And so the Vermont ARA has been really emphasizing the program or the, the bill that was introduced in the state legislature for a couple of terms now, called Universal Primary Care for All. That means all Vermonters. No age differences, no anything differences, everybody. And it almost passed, I think, 
this past legislative session because for the first time it passed the Senate unanimously and it also passed in the House and unfortunately the session ended before they could do the resolution committee between the two uh, bodies in the state legislature. So maybe next session is our time. We don't know. But I hopefully we'll hear something from David and Jill about that. And maybe George too. I don't know. But that's the scoop. We would love you to join us. The more people that we have, the more impact we'll have on the legislature and on the population of Vermont. And with all that, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> so, George, would you like to go first? Start at the high level. Start yes. Congress and work our start, way down. Start where all the money is. <laughs> start with the one person who's never been elected to anything in their life. <laughs> Well, good morning. I'm uh, George Twig. I'm the state director for Congressman Peter Welch, and uh, glad to be here with you this morning. And I'll just make a few remarks, and then um, I guess hand it off to these, these folks, and then maybe we'll take questions after that. Is that what you had in mind? Up to you. Okay. Um, so, uh, lest there be any doubt, um, the 2018 elections were a success for Democrats. Um, you know, on the House side, we uh, picked up, uh, it's going to be on the order of 40 seats or so. Um, you know, it seemed a little bit ambiguous. <laughs> um, it seemed a little bit ambiguous on election night, but as the results was kept coming in, especially with places like California that had late polls, um, I just saw a uh, infographic this morning that showed that uh, Orange County, California, is now completely controlled by Democrats in the House. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, in Arizona, right? Arizona, um, and uh, I think uh, Susan Collins is the only member of Congress representing any New England state now in yeah, 2020. 2020, we'll see what happens with that. Um, you know, uh, Congressman Welch is honored to be re-elected here in Vermont, um, and uh, he'll be going back to Congress uh, primarily serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is one of the four sort of most powerful committees on the House side. It covers not only energy, but also issues related to health care and many other areas. Uh, this was the committee that the uh, Obamacare repeal was, was driven through uh, last year, so it has a broad jurisdiction, and coming back with the uh, Democrats in the majority, uh, we will be in a good position, uh, hopefully, to do a lot of uh, positive, proactive things on health care, on prescription drugs, on energy, climate, and a lot of other issues. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, Peter's really excited to be back. It'll be the first time uh, he'll have been in the majority since 2010. So it's been a little bit of a, a gap, so it'll be uh, good to get back to that. And um, again, being active, um, you know, listening to Vermonters, bringing their ideas down to DC and um, doing things that are positive and proactive as opposed to just having to find creative ways to vote no on Paul Ryan's latest bad idea. Um, you know, right now we are in the, the late, what's called the lame duck session, right, between the election and when the new Congress is sworn in in January. So uh, we're not expecting a lot of drama over the next few weeks, although you never know. Um, a lot of the federal spending bills got uh, resolved um, back in the fall. Um, so the notable exception being the appropriations related to a few agencies, including most notably the Department of Homeland Security, where there will be some uh, fighting over the uh, uh, President Trump's uh, uh, request for five billion dollars or more to fund the wall, which Peter does not support, and you know most Democrats and a lot of Republicans honestly don't support. Um, so there'll be some skirt, there'll be some scuffling over that, but otherwise I think it'll be fairly drama free until we get into the new Congress, where obviously we'll have a, a, a new, a much, much different dynamic, where as opposed to uh, unified Republican control of uh, all, you know, of government, we will have the Democrats in control of the House. So that will change things significantly. Um, you know, in terms of the outlook for uh, the new Congress, uh, touch on a, just a few things. One is. You know, there will continue to be uh, a lot of, um, I think, struggle between, you know, House Democrats and then the Senate Republicans and the President over what are the uh, federal budget priorities going to be in terms of military spending versus domestic investment on health care, infrastructure, transportation, a lot of the things that we need to do to 
kind of keep our country strong domestically. Um, we've actually had a fair amount of success over the past couple of years, even with President Trump, in terms of um, in, uh, increased investment domestically. So despite the President's budget proposal is to slash the EPA, slash Department of Energy, sl uh, you know, slash nutrition and healthcare programs, um, you know, uh, Democrats in Congress, um, and with a big, I think, thank you to Senator Leahy because of his senior role on the Senate Appropriations Committee, we've actually been able to keep domestic spending priorities uh, pretty well protected despite a, a lot of pressure from the President to try to push all that onto the military side. So we're hoping with even a stronger hand with uh, Democrats in control, control of the House that we'll be able to continue to push those priorities in terms of what we need to do domestically in particular to take care of um, you know, not only seniors, but all Americans, including the most vulnerable, um, you know, investments in infrastructure, housing, uh, all of those things. So, you know, big picture, that, that's going to continue to be a priority for us and for Peter is really identifying, you know, what we need to be doing to, um, uh, you know, on the domestic side to, to, protect, uh, to protect Americans and Vermonters. Uh, on the big picture, uh, you know, so-called entitlement programs, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, there was a lot of, I think, concern, justifiably so, in the last Congress with, uh, with Speaker Ryan and his real uh, passion for trying to undo and weaken a lot of those programs. Uh, we saw that those efforts did not get a lot of traction, fortunately, and now he will be out of the picture, um, thankfully. And so, you know, going forward, I don't see a lot of major um, legislative uh, uh, action happening um, with those programs. You know, there'll be, I think, ongoing discussions about, you know, long-term, uh, you know, Social Security Trust Fund and, and other issues. But I really think that, you know, for Democrats, kind of protecting those programs, protecting the people to whom those promises were made to benefit from those programs is going to be the priority as opposed to kind of a, you know, uh, conservative, you know, re-engineering, you know, breaking of those of that deal and those promises that were made, and so that will be certainly Peter's priority uh, going forward on that. Um, and I think you'll see strong Democratic support for that. And the way, of course, the Senate is structured, they won't be able to do anything without you know significant support from Democratic senators. So I think we'll be in a good place to help to protect you know the core part of, the, of those programs. Um, uh, the outside of the um, kind of legislative piece, the other thing that we we'll watching very closely will be sort of what is the Trump administration doing with the regulatory agencies and the administrative agencies? So what is you know the Department of Health and Human Services doing that might potentially weaken um, uh, weaken benefits or weaken programs? You know we've seen um, waivers being issued for states to impose say work requirements for food and nutrition benefits, which is something that we're very concerned about. You know, Arkansas just threw 12,000 people off of their food, off of their nutrition rolls, just based on supposed non-compliance with um, new work requirements there. And it's you know these you know online work requirements where you have to like get on a smartphone and click on something to certify your your you know that you've been doing the work that you're you're supposedly required to do. And a lot of people that they don't have smartphones, they don't have access to the internet. So and people are like losing their nutrition program. So a lot of concern over. You know, obviously Congress can control what happens on the legislative side, but the Trump administration, the executive branch, has a lot of authority to try to do things on the administrative side and with rulemaking. So one good thing about Democrats taking over the House is that we will now have oversight power and subpoena power over all of those activities. So whether it's um, adding a citizenship question to the census or any of these other rule changes to some of these programs, We'll be able to call these Trump administration officials to committee, subpoena them if we have to, and force them to answer questions about what are they doing, why are they doing it, what's their legal justification, and if we have to push back through lawsuits or other means to fight these, as we have in a lot of cases already, we'll continue to do that. But that's sort of the, the biggest, um, I think, concern that Peter has is, again, those regulatory actions that don't necessarily require Congress's sign-off. But we will have more oversight, so I think that will be a good thing. The last thing I'll say before handing it off to these folks is we are very aware of how the fe what the federal government does impacts the state on a lot of areas. So whether it's water quality funding, transportation funding, human services funding, you know, I think, I can't remember, it's like 30% plus of the state budget, which is actually federal funding pass-through, 
And so we're very aware that what the decisions that Peter and Congress is making have a real direct effect on the ability of, of uh, Representative Kowinski and Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman to do their jobs to help to craft a budget um, and policies that are going to be good for Vermonters from the state government perspective. So the good news is I think they're a very close partnership. You know, our office talks to them constantly and vice versa to make sure that particular issues that are of concern to Vermont are on the, ra the radar for Peter and the rest of the congressional delegation so we can make sure to fight for those priorities. That's a good partnership and that's something that we will continue to do. And I think we're the envy of a lot of states and that our legislative delegation and our state government partners work very closely together to try to make sure we can have as much impact as we do. So. You know, between uh, Congressman Welch's position, Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, you know, we all we all work very closely together with our state partners. Um, so finally, what I'll say is, you know, we often get a question in our office, you know, what can we as the general public do to help um, protect and you know preserve some of these issues that are of concern? You know, so there's a couple of things to say. One is, you know, remain active and remain outspoken, and whether that means you know coming to public meetings like this, going to demonstrations calling our office or emailing us um, when an issue comes up that's of concern. Because sometimes we'll hear, well, what's the point of calling Peter Welch? Like, we know he's going to support our issue. But it's actually really important we continue to hear from you because mm -hmm. that gives us a sense of how strongly people feel about an issue and that, and that this is a thing, this is a matter that is still of concern. So it might be something that, yes, it's, you know, Peter's going to vote for, um, you know, some of these fundamental issues, absolutely. But to know, you know, the, the level of intensity and passion that we, uh, Vermonters are bringing to this issue, it's really uh, important and valuable for us to hear that and to know that. And it's information that Peter can bring back to his colleagues when he's fighting for these issues to say, well, I just got a letter from such and such in Elmore, Vermont, and they said, you know, this is how this issue would impact them. And that's, you know, we can use that as testimony in committee on the House floor. So those stories are really important. Um, the second thing I'd say is, um, you know, continue to support, whether it's organizations like this or others, you know, we can only do so much in Congress, but to have these outside organizations that um, bring their own pressure to bear is, is really valuable as well. So those are, I think, a couple of things that you can do to keep involved. Obviously, the 2020 elections will be here before we know it. Um, so, so please keep active, keep in touch with our office. Um, and, um, you know, we are always glad to, to be of help and to hear of concerns or issues that are of interest to you. So with that, I'll hand it over. Oh. George. Um Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what, what I'm really curious about, there's been several bills over the years, mostly started by Bernie Sanders, but not all. Some come from the uh, House, where um, they're attempting to increase Social Security's uh, financial situation by doing things like scrap the cap, that's the buttons that we have, and everybody knows that they're if you are working, whether it's for a salary or, or for yourself, that there is a cap which fluctuates, goes up, according to whatever the cost of living is, that change that is that year. And they've always gone nowhere. It makes so much sense because what used to be considered a really good wage is now, if, if that middle class, and yet, if you make over a hundred and, what is it? Now it's up to about 128,000. Um, um, anybody over that does not have Social Security taken out of their salary or their income. And that just makes no sense whatsoever. So that would be a very easy fix, you would think. And the other thing is, um, the way that the COLA is calculated for seniors is wrong, just plain wrong. It's based on working people, mostly white collar working people. And the kinds of things they need are not the kinds of things we need because we don't buy new cars. We rarely buy a new house. Uh, we would like to pay our medical bills and there hasn't been any great, wonderful uh, improvement in Medicare. So, do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> sure. Um, so, 
Just briefly, I, I know on the, the, the issue of the COLA adjustment, Congressman Welch, and I think the entire delegation has been supportive of legislation to change the basis uh, on which that's calculated. Um, and uh, I can't remember what the name of the bill is, but essentially that the so-called basket of goods that you should look at for calculating the cost of living, the actual cost of living for a senior, you know, it should be, um, as you say, not so much, you know, buying a new house or a, a new car or something, but, you know, what's the cost of prescription drugs, what's the cost of food, what's the cost of housing? So that's something that we need to continue to work on. And then on the cap issue, that's, you know, that seems kind of like a no-brainer, and I think we saw with the tax bill last year, you know, going very much in the opposite direction in terms of asking the wealthy to pay their fair share. <laughs> Obviously, the, the cap on Social Security, not having people, you know, once you get over that 128,000, not paying any Social Security tax at all, doesn't make a lot of sense. And to the extent people are concerned about the Social Security Trust one, you know, there's a pretty easy revenue source out there to look at. So, um, you know, we'll see. You know, I think what you'll see, you know, Chris, in terms of crystal ball, will be a lot of good progressive legislation coming out of the House, and then obviously there'll be a fight in Mitch McConnell's Senate and with the White House. <laughs> yeah. But you know, at least we'll be able, you know, with control of the House, we'll be able to at least start to have a conversation about trying to advance these and hopefully make progress on some of these priorities. So, um, so do you? Um, do you want us uh, to continue yeah. to go down the line, or well, I just want to know if anybody else wants to. Okay, over here. You either have to talk really loud or else come up. Thank you, Karen. I just wanted to uh, follow up Jane's comments about Scrap the Cap. I believe this wonderful um, <laughs> phrase uh, was invented right here in, among the Vermont uh, Alliance for Retired Americans. I think this is, know very well. That's true. I think the late Jeff Briggs was uh, the inventor of this great. Yeah. It's so easy to remember, and I think I uh, wanted to be sure that you have a keepsake from today, and we wish you all the best uh, in uh, helping us to help mm -hmm. scrap the cap. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep on going, yeah. and then maybe we can open it up for questions. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Representative Jill Krowinski. I represent the Old North End in downtown um, Burlington. And I am also currently the House Majority Leader. And <laughs> thank you, Jay. I really appreciate the invitation to come uh, and be here with you today. Uh, Jane and I go way back. We've been friends for I think 15 years now. Mm -hmm. so, at least yeah. that. So it's nice to see you all. I am um, also proud to have with us uh, State Representative Terry McCabe, who's here, and, and one of our um, superstar candidates who didn't make it across the finish line this year, but will in 2020, Dennis Labonte in the back. Dennis, thank you for running. So, uh, last legislative session, Democrats held 83 seats out of 150 and um, ran a, a lot with a coalition with the progressives that had seven uh, members in the House. And even together, we didn't quite have enough votes to override um, a veto of the governor if that came to be. And so looking at this, this past election, it was really critical to us that we grow our majorities so that we can have a veto-proof coalition that would bring the governor to the table. Uh, time and time again, throughout last, uh, throughout last biennium, it was really hard uh, to work together to get things done for Vermonters. You know, as Democrats, we want a Vermont that works for everyone, not just a select few, and policies that were really important to help Vermont families and communities thrive, like paid family leave were vetoed. And I think uh, what, we, what we hope now is that starting on day one, uh, the governor will be joining us at that table to help us with these really important policies that help that help everyone get ahead and give everyone a fair shot. So out of 150 seats in the House um, on election night, we are proud to say that we grew our majority from 83 Democrats to 95 Democrats, and the progressives kept seven seats. So we now have a veto-proof coalition of 102 members. <laughs> We're really proud of that, but I, I think the message, the message that I take from that from Vermonters across the state is that they want us to work together. They want Democrats and Republicans and progressives and independents to come to the table to, to really debate and get into the details and pass good compromising legislation that shows that you can um, 
we were I was just talking with Kevin about this, that we can, we can be the model um, across the country about good civil discourse and how we can work together. So uh, I, that's, that's my mission and my thought as we, we move into this next legislative session. Right now, the Speaker of the House, Mitzi Johnson and I, uh, are, are touring the state, listening to all, all members of our caucuses to hear what, what, are, what are members hearing from their constituents. When we were out knocking on doors this campaign cycle, what were the problems that people were sharing with us and what can we do to solve those problems? And uh, one of the themes that have been coming out of these conversations are, are people's concerns about aging in place and being able to stay in their homes, uh, being able to get around town. We talked about transportation, we mentioned that earlier, um, and, and healthcare is another theme. So I think it, it's, it's interesting that um, these, aren't, these aren't new uh, priorities that are coming to light, that people are voicing the same concerns that we need to do more. And so when thinking about healthcare, um, making sure that it's more accessible, more affordable, and more transparent, um, are themes that I'm hearing. And I, I'm really proud of the work that the House did on the Universal Primary Care Bill. Uh, you know, it, the, the, the Senate um, spent a lot of time in consideration looking at uh, what a universal primary care system would look like and created a study for it. When it came to the House, we took it a step further and we needed um, more time to review it to say, how could we get this in place? Um, without a study, but actually moving forward with it. And so I think there's going to be a lot more conversation about how can we um, look at universal primary care uh, moving forward, given the realities of our political makeup, and um, what can we do to increase access and make it more affordable. So that conversation will absolutely be continuing. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of housing, we passed a housing bond that uh, would create over $30 million more um, housing stock available in the state. But I think one of, one of the things that we're hearing is that people, people want to continue to be able to stay in their homes, and how can we help make that work for them? So I think that will also be a conversation that we're having um, uh, at this next legislative session. Uh, one of my constituents, Tony Runnington, is part of AARP's work group. I'm, just, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads here. Uh, so Tony and I talk a lot about how we can make um, downtowns and, and rural areas more accessible for biking and for walking. And uh, I, I've been in contact and in conversations with AARP about what that looks like. And, um, and, and weatherization is another, another theme. Um, ensuring people have access to that, funding for that. And, and then I'll go back to paid family leave for a minute. I, I, I really believe that we're making progress when we look at how we can update our, our laws and our rules to reflect that or what our families look like now. Now we have two parents in the workplace, not one staying at home, and a lot of our laws are still living in the 60s and the 70s, and it's time that we update that. So we've made progress by passing paid sick days, and we've, and we've made progress passing paid family leave. Unfortunately, the governor vetoed that bill, but that bill had tripartisan support. Tripartisan support. And what it gave was new parents, both parents, 12 weeks off with 80% wage replacement and four weeks to take care of a sick parent. And we heard just as many stories from Vermonters about having to take care of a, a new child, but also trying to take care of a sick, a sick parent, someone who's getting chemo and having that time to be able to take um, your parent to the hospital to get that treatment and really take care of them, that's important. And that's a value that I think we share of being able to take care of our families. So again, we will be looking at, at that um, piece of legislation as well. You know, one, I think, new addition to our priorities and something that was um, a bigger, a bigger um, concern for us this session than in others is how we work and respond to the federal government. I think this is actually just like we have our work on what we want to be proactive of, and now we have this um, group of priorities of what do we need to do to um, protect Vermonters from what's happening out of the Trump administration. So we had passed um, legislation that last, last session that protected um, Vermonters' voter information from the federal government when they were trying to reach in to get people's social security numbers, very personal information. Uh, we work to protect Vermonters from that. 
Uh, we also passed a, a slew of bills to protect Vermonters from the ACA rollbacks that they were doing in Washington. So I think, you know, George mentioned some of this. We have a really great relationship. I, I believe we have the best federal delegation in the country. And, and we need to continue to work together to make sure that Vermonters um, don't, uh, you know, we're protecting Vermonters from whatever harmful policies Congress might not be able to stop, but it's happening through rules, um, through the administration to ensure that uh, we, we, we really protect us. So I'll, I'll close by saying, um, and I echo what George says, that your, your voice matters. Your voice really matters in this conversation. And so if there's an issue that you care about, like universal primary care, like paid family leave, you really need to reach out and talk to your legislator. You know, give them a call, send them an email, go out, grab coffee together. Your voice really makes a difference. And I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to members about an upcoming vote, and they will say, well, I heard from five of my constituents on this, so I know people are listening. It really, so your voice really does make a difference. And so um, I just uh, also just want to recognize before I pass the mic over that uh, Representative Janet Ansel just came in the building. Janet also. <laughs> of the Ways and Means Committee has just done incredible work, uh, and sh I'm sure we'll give the microphone to her to speak a little bit about the work she did last session uh, to help aging Vermonters. So thank you very much. It's great to be here, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, thank you, uh, David Zuckerman, Lieutenant Governor and Lieutenant Governor-elect. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, my uh, my two colleagues here have done a, a great job of laying some of the landscape, so I'll try and uh, do a little cleanup. But uh, I have to say the election results uh, were phenomenal across the country, and I know it's hard to imagine that with the down scenario of the Senate, but you have to remember how the table was set uh, and actually Democrats defended a number of U.S. Senate seats in districts and states, I should say, that were overwhelmingly Trump supportive uh, two years ago. So it actually was pretty good holding back on that side as well. Uh, and I want to give kudos to all of you in this room and Vermonters across state, because I did hear at one point along the way that Vermonters were actually some of the most contributory and both financially per capita, as well as time helping with phone calls, writing postcards to people all over the country to help get turnout up. So while we uh, were fortunate that our congressional delegation was not uh, particularly challenged in this race, Vermonters participated and helped in other states. And I know some of you did that as well. So I want to thank you for that because the impact is very real. Taking over the US House makes a difference to Vermont, as, as uh, George said, with respect to uh, the ability to either stop bad legislation or start working on some of these kinds of adjustments like how the COLA affects Social Security and whether or not an idea like that can be moved forward because frankly there are seniors in every state so if some of those Republican senators don't support bills that will help seniors across the country with adjustments to COLA they will be vulnerable in the future so when we take the right positions on issues we actually do put pressure on making it better and better uh, Congress and Senate in, in years going forward. So thank you for all your help with that. Uh, I was just literally in, in thinking during this discussion about seniors staying in place. I thought, oh, what about an idea like? And I just want you to know whenever we throw out an idea, it means it needs investigation, it needs the work of committees. I don't know if this is possible or not. It would actually be a ways and means issue. Um, you know, many seniors live in homes that are bigger than they need. And my friend Kirby Dunn runs HomeShare, which is a great program, but is, is not as well known or utilized across the state. But similarly, what if multiple seniors were to live in a house together and we were to say, okay, on your property tax homestead adjustment, the added income in that house wouldn't be counted if it was a third or a fourth senior in the same house. I don't know, it's an idea, but that would not only um, help with having more seniors living together who could assist each other with the things that you need day to day, but also would then make more housing available, which would help make affordable housing, you know, the more housing there is relative to demand, the, the less it gets the pressure to uh, go up as much as it has. 
I have no idea if that would work. Literally thought about it while these two were talking. Um, so we'd have to do a lot of investigating how much would it cost the state or not. But uh, I think it could be a net plus. I think another issue that hasn't been talked about that I think is very important, and sometimes it's a secondary attachment to the issues of this room, is the work on the benefits cliff. Those of you that don't know what the benefits cliff is, it says folks who are struggling to make a living and do get state assistance or combined state and federal assistance for childcare or food or housing, there comes a point sometimes where if they take on more hours or get paid more per hour, they actually lose more in benefits than they gain in their hourly wage. If groups like this group understand and help push for the ability to make an adjustment there, where we remove that cliff and more folks are able to move up uh, in the economic ladder in the workforce side of things, then the demand on state services will actually drop, which will free up resources that would then become available for other aspects of either state government, including maybe it's a little bit more on public transportation to help seniors get around. Maybe it's a little bit more to make it possible to do this, combine more seniors in a home together and have a little tax break for it. Who knows? But each of these pieces, I guess my main point is each of these different pieces are interrelated. And sometimes we get fixated on a single issue that we care about and don't see how some of these other issues can also help us in a secondary way. So part of that is a coalition scenario. And I know uh, Jill has been doing a great job building coalitions in the house and we'll continue to do that in this session moving forward with these new numbers on who knows what the next creative idea is. Usually they come from folks like you in the room, not from someone like me sitting on a panel thinking while I'm listening. Um, and then I just want to wrap, um, because really it should be more about uh, questions from you all, is uh, staying involved between the elections really does matter. Two years from now, I happen to think that the wave we had this year was actually just the beginning. When you look statistically, and I'm a 538.com person, for those who don't know, we can talk about it afterwards, but it's a national statistics analytical website. Um, the number of House seats and Senate seats that with another bump in turnout during the presidential year, especially if we do a little better than we did two years ago, that will continue to move in our direction, will make this year look small. Uh, there's sort of a tipping point because of all the gerrymandering that happened by Republicans in other states that uh, there comes a point where they actually can't hold it back because they've jerry-rigged it in their favor to a point, but then it sort of tips the other way if we get higher turnout. So staying involved for these next couple of years, writing letters to the editor, whether they be locally here or engaging even in other states, uh, is cr incredibly important, as well as the communication that uh, Representative Kerensky was talking about to your own legislator, because it is true on most issues Legislators hear from literally three to five constituents. And on a few big issues, if an email goes out from the Alliance or from someone else, sometimes the calls bump up more. But it's amazing how much voice one or three or five people can have because even in our very engaged state, so few people do reach out. And that will help make a difference, particularly in those districts where maybe a legislator did just win re-election who maybe isn't sure if they're supportive of this but they only won by 30 or 50 or 100 votes. Well, two years from now, they're gonna be thinking about the fact that there's gonna be another 40,000 Vermonters voting, which means 400 more in their district, which means they better think about these issues that you care about. So do stay engaged, not just with your legislators who are friendly, but be friendly with your legislators who are not friendly <laughs> to our issues and help them understand how it helps their district and their constituents to work progressively on these issues that, uh, that we're talking about. So thank you for having us, and I'll give the mic back to you for questions, Janet, or Janet for a minute. Yeah, you want to pull yeah, yeah pull it. I'll, I'll slide over a little. Is thank you so much for getting here. We'll need one more button, by the way.
So uh, good morning, and I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late, but um, and I, but I had a chance to listen to a, a bit of the other presenters, and I want to underscore in particular um, what David talked about with activism and how important um, the, the letters, the, the financial support, the, um, the emails that went around, um, all of those things, how much that meant, I, I believe nationally, I had groups, I, I live in Callis and I represent Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield, and those uh, three towns were incredibly active. Um, they did postcards, they did um, all kinds of stuff, and it made a difference, I believe it made a difference nationally, I believe it made a difference within the state as well, um, and it has uh, a lot to do with the fact that we have larger numbers um, in the House this coming session. Um, and I think it also made a difference in an intangible way in how people felt. Um, and they felt that they had something that they could do and, and they, had a, um, they, they had a voice in, um, in a, a political world that I don't know about all of you, but certainly for me, I felt um, sort of uh, left on the sidelines at the end of, of, of the 2016 election. So, um, so I, I really um, encourage people to, um, to get involved in those groups if you aren't already. I know that you're already activists because you're here. Um, and so uh, I also agree that letting uh, legislators know what, what it is you think. You'd be surprised um, how important three phone calls or emails or letters really, really are because we don't hear um, from tons of people, although sometimes those when the, when the uh, mass emails get started, we do hear from a whole lot. Those matter, but, uh, but it's those really those individual ones that when you feel moved about an issue and you are concerned about something, um, when you reach out to us, it really does make a difference. Um, with respect to work that we did last session, um, I'm not going to weigh in on David's idea. It's a yes. brand new <laughs> idea. Who knows, right? <laughs> but David's always full of good ideas, <laughs> so I have to pay attention to them. Um, but um, I don't know whether anybody talked about the Social Security change that we made last year. Um, that, that, um, that happened um, principally in my committee. I chair the Ways and Means Committee. Um, just to set the table a little bit after the um, feds made their major tax changes at the very end of the calendar year. Um, we were left with a situation where all those changes were gonna have very big impacts in Vermont. Um, and this was actually, unlike uh, a number of other issues, it was an issue where I think the legislature and the administration worked very cooperatively and worked well together. And we were able to come up with a, a massive um, uh, uh, restructuring of our income tax system, um, which my, the, my headline on it is that it was better for low and middle income taxpayers in, and that included seniors. Um, and the way the, 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 just the, the two sort of more, most significant changes that we made um, for uh, low and middle income households, uh, we did an increase in the earned income tax credit. Um, that's not something typically that seniors get, a, get to take advantage of, um, but it helps uh, groups that I know we care about. Um, and then the other thing we did is that we uh, increased the exemption on Social Security. Uh, the administration had proposed an increase, but they were going to phase it in over three years. And we looked at that and we thought, boy, if you're doing, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're giving $5 million back to seniors and you're doing it over three years, um, that's a little over a million each year. That There's just too many people uh, for that to really make a difference for people. So we pushed hard to do it all in year one. Um, I was actually somebody who wanted to exempt all Social Security, but that was gonna cost about 30 million, so we weren't able to pull that off. Um, but we were able to um, greatly increase the exemption. And so, um, I feel that that was, a, that was a really positive restructuring. That's not something that's going to disappear. That, if anything, that's going to grow. It, it, it's not going to go away. Sometimes we make changes, and I worry that you know, we're going to look at them, and we're going to regret them, and we're going to you know, um, reduce them over time. But in this case, I think that's not true. I think, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, so. That's, um, that's just a little flavor of the kind of work that we do. Um, 
our committee does do all the ed finance and property tax work as well, and we made a real effort to try to revise the, uh, that and move more towards income for funding education. And um, I'm, I, I tend to say that I failed, um, but I think what I did is I, 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 I got close, um, we got close, we were working on it all as a committee, um, but we didn't get it over the finish line, and um, that doesn't mean that we won't take another attempt at it, but it was a disappointment, uh, certainly for me. Um, so I will stop and see if there are questions. I was just wondering, Janet, could you compare Vermont to other states in terms of whether um, Social Security is exempt from taxes in other states? We're much more like other states at this point. Um, and there are a few states that exempt it all. There are, of course, some states that don't have an income tax, so it's effectively exempt. Um, and I think there might be one or two that only left remaining that only pass through the federal exemption. Before we did this, there is a federal exemption, and that did pass through to the state. So it wasn't true that we didn't exempt anything, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't have a state exemption. So we're much more like other states at this point. Okay. Yeah, in response to David's idea, bad idea. Bad idea. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's a good idea, the idea of people sharing housing, but rather than putting several seniors together, what you need is a young couple getting subsidized to live with the seniors so they, they're the people who can drive them to the grocery store, yeah. do other you know, yard work, whatever. I wasn't saying in, in uh, exclusion of that. I was saying in addition to that. Grover Marquist and all those people want, you know, they say, stop with people who can't afford it. So rather than like starting political fights and deregulation, what they're doing is gutting these agencies so that nothing can be enforced. So how, do, how does the federal budget restore some of what's been cut from these agencies? The other question I have in terms of like gerrymandering, the census. Mm -hmm. yeah. My brother works as a yeah. census worker out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He said it was an utterly corrupt process. Mm -hmm. And there were all these jobs for patronage jobs. Data was, he was finding houses and streets that were put in the last census that didn't even exist. So, I mean, so what, how can we somehow make the Census Bureau accountable in terms of actually collecting real data? Because, I mean, everybody's apportionment is based on population, right? Right. Um, I mean, I think the. Democrats having control of the House gives us vastly more um, uh, oversight ability than we had before. So as I said earlier, whether it's the Census Bureau, whether it's the EPA, if they're failing to hire people, if they're failing to uh, have adequate enforcement, if they're failing to be competent in what they're doing with, with a, an accurate census count, uh, we can haul them in. I mean, Peter's currently on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, at least for this Congress. I'm not sure about next year. but. Um, we'll be able to drag those people in. Now, you know, we have to face facts. You know, the executive branch has vast power to kind of interpret and carry out laws in the way that they see fit. But that power is not unlimited. So, for instance, with the census right now, there is a lawsuit that's uh, in process um, against the Census Bureau for adding the citizenship question. I think it's pretty clear to us that there's been, uh, I guess, a lack of complete candor from the administration about why they added a citizenship question to the census for 2020. Um, and our fear is that this will suppress um, you know, participation in terms of getting an accurate count from uh, und undocumented individuals and, and other, um, other communities of color. So you know, we have some more leverage there, whether it's through the courts, whether it's through the oversight process uh, to push back on this. Um, but I mean, it's going to take, I mean, ultimately it'll take a change in administration in 2020 to fundamentally address those issues. So. We'll be doing what we can to push back on those issues, and you know, outside pressure, again, outside agitation from groups like this will be will be helpful in raising public awareness. Because again, there's so much going on <laughs> all the time, right? So, uh, but trying to um, uh, get focus on some of these issues of, of real concern will, we'll, you know, it'll be something we'll all have to work on. So, that's a question that, that I had in can't hear you uh, in seeing a notice up the the census. Speak was, up, Corinna. All right. In seeing a notice up that the census was looking to hire people in this area, a question that I have is, would doing that job put people who are here who are undocumented um, or documented but without citizenship stop, uh, st status that would allow them to stay, would it put them in jeopardy um, if we were collecting that information and it, of course, was available to the 
administration, is that a problem that now with working for the census, current as it stands, the, without the. I'm not sure I expect to understand your question. With the census, <coughs> as it's currently set up, with the plans that the administration currently has, the questions that are currently to be asked. Would working for the census and asking those questions in Vermont be putting people who are here who don't have status that would enable them to not be deported, would it put those people in jeopardy? I, mean, I think that, that's the understandable concern of people who might have that question posed tonight, and that's been our concern about having that question added. Now what the census, you know, what the Department of Commerce, which runs the census, is, has claimed, um, and I think that what the law re requires is that that information can't be passed through, but obviously if you're, if you're a person with a status like that, your concern would be understandable. And so even from a perception per perspective, that's why I think there's a lot of concern from, from outside. Well, and we've seen, that at the, we've seen that at the state level with some of the DMV data mm -hmm. that was transferred even though they weren't supposed to. So if you're someone who has that concern, just because it says in law this is not supposed to be transferred, it takes a, oops, I made a mistake by someone who is okay with that mistake happening to put your life in jeopardy and certainly your life in its current form in jeopardy. So that's, I think, the crux of that, that debate right now is that we have not asked that question in the past and so we've gotten a more accurate census count and adding that question will probably lead to a lot of people not answering this, the questions and therefore the census is lowered and therefore the state, I think George talked earlier about how 30% 30, 30 of our budget dollars are federal dollars, those are often based on census count numbers. And so again, how one, one issue can have these snowball ramifications for all of these others is absolutely true. Yeah, I had a question about, this is on the federal level, George. Um, the PBGC, the Pension Benefit Guaranteed Corporation, which is kind of like the backstop and insurance program for private sector pensions is in deep trouble. There's two components to the PBGC. One uh, ensures single employer plans, that, that part is okay. But the one for multi-employer pension plans, which are essentially Taft-Hartley plans, these are union, you know, labor management plans, there are some plans which are in significant trouble, particularly the Teamster Central States plan, which by itself, if it goes down, when it goes down, it's just a matter of time, will bankrupt the PBGC. Uh, there are other plans like the Mine Workers is in a similar situation, and there's some smaller plans which are also in that precarious situation. A few Congresses ago, pen, uh, Congress passed something called the uh, uh, MEPRA, the Multi-Employer Pension Reform Act, which is kind of a misnomer because what it did, it allowed multi, the trustees of multi-employer pension plans to cut the benefits of existing retirees, which we think is the absolute worst way to deal with the crisis in the pension, in the private sector pension plan. So currently, as a result of that, the pushback that came from that legislation, there is a bipartisan, bicarmel uh, committee that is supposed to be looking at, right now, a solution to the multi-employer pension funding crisis. And they're supposed to make recommendations to the Congress before the end of the year as to how to solve this problem. Now, we shouldn't think, you know, the Teamster Central States is primarily in the Midwest, but it has members which are retirees in Vermont, across the country, everywhere. So this is, in a sense, a national uh, problem that has to be addressed. They're very concerned, I can tell you. I did some work, I used to work in DC, and we did some work trying to keep what's called composite plans, which, which are a hybrid plan that would allow building construction trade contractors to get out what's called the drug liability. I'm getting into the weeds in this, but in a sense, <laughs> you know, this you is- You might want to use the microphone. Oh, sorry, I'm always stuck. <laughs> but, and they said, this has to be approached very carefully because the PBGC was set up some 40 years ago to make sure that if a pension plan went down, the retirees would still have some type of benefit coming in. And that people that contributed to this, you know, this is the real element, you know, there's three sectors to retirement security, social security, pension, savings. Well, we were eliminating the private sector pension, which is a big mistake, because that's a key component of um, retirement security. And this has to be addressed in a real significant way that's gonna fund the plans 
You know, a lot of us think that, you know, uh, 10 years ago we had a crisis. We had tarp to bill out Wall Street. We tried to get that money to go to uh, the PDGC. The Obama administration, of all people, turned us down. You know, there are factors, there are solutions like that that have to be addressed. And I want to just make sure that the congressman understands that, that this is not to be taken lightly because a lot of people's lives at stake, their retirement security is at stake, and it has to be addressed in a way that does not blame the victim, which other legislation has done. Great. Well, thanks. I'll try, for those who didn't hear, I'll try to restate that question. <laughs> Comment a statement. Brief, 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 brief. statement. Um, is it really about what's Congress going to do with the, the, the pension bear, uh, uh, PBGC, Pension, pension Benefit, Benefit Corporation. Gar Gar Guaranteed Corporation, which is a backstop to a lot of private pensions and particularly labor pensions. So, um, and there's a study committee looking into this. So, um, I'm not familiar with the work of that study committee, but I'd be glad to check in on that and give you my card and follow up on that. But obviously, you know, retirement security, whether it's through private pensions or, or you know, social security or other means, is you know a serious, you know, obviously a, a, a huge issue. And so, yeah, financial security through these plans is, needs to be a priority. And I understand your comment about making sure it's addressed thoughtfully, so that current beneficiaries versus you know. Other employees are, are not you know, sort of harmed in terms of trying to address the situation. So, thanks. I just want to follow up on the issue of pensions in general. You know, we had was, the conversation about pensions was a big part of the special session in the budget negotiations that the legislature had with the governor and. Uh, we were advocating to use more of the one-time funds that we were debating about for pensions. Uh, and, and we tried really hard to get as much of that one-time money into pensions, uh, uh, even though, you know, despite the governor's pushback on that and wanting to use it for something else. We, that, the issue about pensions for state employees and teachers is going to be right back uh, front and center right. when we get back to the state house in January. So I do want to raise that um, with all of you because we're going to need your help. Um, and, and protecting the promises that we made and making sure that we can keep those promises. I, I just want to say I really salute the Democrats for doing that because that is saving the money, the state money, big time yeah. down the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jane? Um, I'm a retired state employee, so I have a personal interest <laughs> in this. Okay. Uh, so the, the BSEA the union is really gearing up to fight because we know what the administration, not the legislature, but the administration is trying to do for the next uh, session. And that will be to somehow reduce pensions. Possibly they're trying very hard to get us into a different pension plan that would not be a defined benefit, but would be a defined contribution, and I won't go into all of that. But um, basically, it's going to cause current employees who are not retired to have smaller pensions. And there's some wonderful rhetoric that goes about how this is so wonderful, and they'll wind up with a lot more money, but the fact of the matter, they don't. Uh, if they have to uh, take this loss. Anyway, all I'm really trying to say is that's bad for workers. These are municipal workers and state workers, but it's bad for all workers to set a precedent of this type. And um, I'm hoping that the legislature will be able to keep it from happening. <laughs> and I just want to add on that in terms of letters to the editor or the discussion that's moving towards the next couple of years and elections. You know, we've often heard this rhetoric that uh, the Republican Party is a party of fiscal responsibility, right? And Democrats and progressives are tax and spend liberals. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that is part of what a constant discussion will shift over time. The fiscally responsible thing to have done the last couple of years was put money into paying down those pension obligations, not for the rate, which frankly at $30 per, ta per property tax bill or $50, uh, yes, that's real money, but in the long run, it's many times that 
in the pension fund growing, which means fewer costs to the state in the future. It means not having the revenue downgrade. You know, under this governor, we had a revenue downgrade uh, from Moody's. That's not what happens if you're fiscally responsible. And so making that connection for people is something that we can say a lot. It usually doesn't get covered very often, but that continuous letter to the editor flow and comment with friends and in discussions you have over coffee or at the senior centers or wherever you may be, shifting that conversation is critical. And so I ask for your help. You say maybe that, you know, hopefully the legislature can do the right thing. The, the pressure that's out there with those memes of, that are inaccurate, right? But that does put political pressure on anybody who's in elected office to go in a direction that sometimes we don't even necessarily want to go. So that's how your help changing that meme makes it easier for us to do the right thing. I just want to add um, one other element. If we're talking about the kinds of issues that we're going to be looking at next year that will have an impact on all of us, including all of you. Um, at the um, proposal is kicking around to use um, some sales tax money uh, to fund childcare. I would love to find a way to fund child care. I think it'd be great. One of the things we did, however, last year is we put all the sales tax into the education fund. So if we take that money out of the education fund and put it into child care, it's all of us who pay property taxes who are going to have to make up the difference. So just be careful when you hear, you know, this is, if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Um, and be skeptical um, and, um, and, um, uh, you know, listen to us. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, these things are going to happen um, all over. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Marge. Good. Well, before I louder, Marge. We can't hear you. <laughs> before I talk about health care reform, I just wanted to chime in on the pension thing. I think one of the reasons that there is not as much support for funding pensions is that not everyone has them, and there is some envy uh, of state employees and teachers and municipal employees that actually do have defined benefit plans. And so I would like to suggest that the legislature start considering, as I think they started last year, a universal pension plan for Vermonters. And that would then obviate this envy issue, like why should I support them when I don't have one? But, but now my main point, which was <laughs> I was very disappointed in the legislature last year, particularly the Senate, with their treatment of the universal primary care bill, because basically it was sabotaged by the leadership yes. itself. It started from a bill that did something to a bill that did less than nothing, and those changes were done by the majority in the Senate. I would not care to see that happen again this year, because it would be horrible to have to go campaigning against people who might otherwise be supported because they are opposing such a a bill that is so important to Vermonters who ha have no access to health care. It's all very well to say mandate, everybody can go on the, um, the uh, exchange, but people don't, and they can't afford it. And even if they have insurance, they can't afford to go to the doctor because of the big deductibles. So we want to see that bill move forward. None of this 
hanky panky, get it down to a one pager that is going backwards. Thanks, Marge. Thank you. I have to say on your first point, we'll start from the top. Uh, it is so lovely to be able to say, we did that. We did pass a plan that would create uh, universal access to universal retirement in the state. We passed that bill. It's currently in the process of being set up by the state treasurer's office. Beth Pierce has been doing incredible work. There were there were listening and education tours across the state. Uh, she has been working tirelessly on this, and so um, so it's coming soon to you. Uh, we did pass that, so that's very exciting. Um, and I'll, so I'll just I'll I'll touch on universal primary care, and I'll, I'll hand it back over to David. You know, we, uh, I have to tell you, for me personally, access to high quality, affordable care has, has really hit home. You know, we talk about it all the time on the campaign trail. I talk about it all, all the time with voters in my community about it. Um, but a couple months ago, um, my husband's cousin was coming down with some symptoms that seemed to be like a heart attack. And we were urging him to go to the doctor, and every time, no matter who it was in the family that was talking to him, he said, I can't, aff I can't afford to go. And we said, doesn't matter, we're going to take you. And he said, no, I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't afford it. I'm going to take it easy for a couple days and see how I feel. And if I don't feel better, then I'll finally go. And he died of a heart attack. And so I think... The barrier of cost should not, should not be there. It should not be there. And I, I think that we, we all agree as a community and our values that people should be able to access care when they need it. And we shouldn't have these barriers. And so Marge, you know, we worked really hard on that universal primary care bill in the house. Uh, I believe that we made it stronger uh, and we needed more time. So uh, I can guarantee that this, this conversation will be happening when we get back to Montpelier. I do. Um, so I, I just want to make sure a couple things are clear. One is that I strongly agree with you. Uh, and sometimes people don't know that the lieutenant governor doesn't actually get to really vote or have much power over these things. But uh, I will tell you a little bit of the of a insider story, uh, which is that I had hoped to have a town meeting uh, sponsored by the Lieutenant Governor's Office in the State House on universal primary care. And uh, there were people in the Senate in positions of power that said, I'd rather you not do that uh, here at the State House, maybe over at the high school, um, but really I'd rather you not do it at all. And I will admit that in my first biennium as Lieutenant Governor and trying to work with uh, a Senate that uh, I think in general is very good on the vast majority of issues, uh, I sort of had to debate, is this the, a battle of having a, a town meeting that may or may not change the outcome this year worth it in the, in the big picture of some other things? But there really was pushback uh, from uh, leadership in the health care committee. Uh, and uh, let's just say by retirement, there's going to be new leadership in that committee. Uh, and but it is, but you know, that senator has had a lot of very good work that they did on many, many issues. Uh, and so I want to make sure people realize that each one of us is a package deal. You know, <laughs> no one here is going to be perfect on every issue for each of you. So I tell you that story not to throw that person under the bus because that person did a lot of really good work as well. But uh, it's important that we, in this new process uh, with a new committee, end up hopefully with a committee that's going to be uh, better on this issue, which is one of the few places I have some say. It's a committee of three, however. Uh, and I would add that Washington County has a new senator. Uh, you already have two senators that I think are very good on this. You have a new senator that will be, I think, far more engaged in this process. Uh, so I would say reach out, for those of you who live in Washington County, to your delegation. Also, reach out to the leadership of the Senate now, because this is when we make the committees. Uh, and point out the importance of this issue so that uh, the concern you have for two years from now, Marge, hopefully won't be one that needs to be executed because we don't want to lose good people over one issue, but we do want to make sure they're better on this one issue, which is so fundamental to economic justice across the board. Uh, so I, again, implore you to engage, but also you are right. The Senate was not in the front role on this in the way we would want it to be. I think someone in the 
you, yeah, yeah, sorry. You, have <laughs> you had your hand up for a while. <laughs> it's a very simple question. Does it make, is it of any import to sign petitions that we get on Facebook? And if so, if we get the same petition from different organizations, do we sign it more than once, or should we? <laughs> Federal or state yeah, level. I mean, a lot of the ones I see are federal issues, typically. The big ones that are done by Move On or Daily Costs or others, they are typically uh, federal. So I guess I would ask George to touch on that. They don't often require you to give money to sign the petition. No, no, no. But. I just want to know. Does, does it help to sign the petition? It, 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 always it always helps to sign a petition, but if you have five minutes and you're choosing the most impactful way that you can make a difference, it's by calling your legislator and saying, I need you to, I want you to vote this way. Right. Yeah. Should we sign it twice? No. <laughs> I'll have to say, um, I, I think this is sort of what Jill was saying, that um, because we represent uh, you know, a district. Um, I, because I'm a committee chair, I hear from people all over the state, and it matters to me. But what really matters to me are what people in my district tell me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you email somebody or sign a petition or whatever, yeah. do any kind of outreach, let people know where you live, um, yeah. because it it does make a difference. Maybe it maybe it shouldn't, but it does. Well, a lot of them have asked you to have your address. Sure, but some don't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll just have, on the federal side, um, it, it makes a difference. Like for us, every contact counts um, as long as it's someone who's from Vermont. So again, making clear that yeah. you're a constituent. And then as far as we're concerned, whether it's a Facebook petition or some other kind of petition, as long as you know what we see is you know these are Vermonters and we have a you know a name and an address, you know that matters. You know as I think Jen and Jill alluded to, certainly uh, you know a direct phone call or a, you know a direct email um, might have more impact than like. You know, of being one of a list of you know, uh, five hundred or a thousand on a on a on a online petition. But you know, as long as you're from Vermont or whatever form it comes in, you know, we tally all those up, we track them, so it all counts. Thank you. Uh, I just want to follow up on the um, ladder bring the uh, healthcare for all in Vermont. Um, I, I and nationally, there's such interest in universal public myth. Healthcare and Medicare for all, and I, I think there's a moment in history to really pick up on that because if we don't do something, the general public they're going to be discouraged and we will lose our credibility. So the moment is there. This is the time to really do stuff in Vermont and nationally. Something ha even if it's you know part of something. I know you may not get it all, but <laughs> you know, increasing um, the credibility of people excuse me, that have said that this is a priority. We need to really respect that and deal with it. You know, one thing we noticed from the uh, election results is that the um, even some very red states, um, when they have referendum on uh, Medicaid expansion, which isn't, isn't quite what you're talking about, but for those states, it was a big step, and those got a lot of support. So we are really seeing, um, I think, a, a change, a shift nationally as well as um, as within the states. So I think you're right. And I just want to add, a couple of years ago, when we were on the verge of universal health care, uh, I heard from plenty of business people saying, this is going to hurt my business or take it down. And my first question was often, what is your current cost as a percentage of your payroll for covering health insurance for the families of your employees, for those that did that coverage? And most of them didn't have that answer. So it goes back to that topic we were on earlier, where the meme or the rhetoric versus actually looking at the fact. And often, if they got back to it, they said, oh, well, I'm already paying 10 or as much as 15%. So then I would say, OK, so an 11 or 12% payroll tax, if you could eliminate that other premium, is more or less a wash. And yet, it's going to mean broader coverage across the state. It's going to mean more money going towards health care and less towards administration, which over time will lower some of those costs, or at least decrease the increase. Uh, and so. I think you're absolutely right, but they're very complicated topics and the numbers are very big and people get scared. And so when 
folks like what you see up here talk to those issues and say we need to do that. And again, you see that pushback. That's when we need to keep having those community discussions to make sure the facts relate to reality versus this alternate universe that's being promulgated, not only for a long time, but now more so by this president, of course. We have to keep going back to actual facts. You'll be seeing me in March of the, 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 the Sorry, Marge who? Marge. <laughs> well, is, is there a way that you can find out from companies what percentage they do pay that would, you know, can you say, okay, this is what the payroll tax would be, but you're making, I mean, you're spending this, you know, you're spending 15% of the payroll tax would only be. We can ask, but that's private information for the business, so it's up to them if they want to disclose that. The, the, uh, sure, in the back. <coughs> yeah, a couple of points. Um, and not all companies um, object to uh, right. I'm the president of Hunger Mountain Co-op currently, and there was a petition. I think that it would be very, very <coughs> acceptable to have, to have to take that off the books and know exactly what you're paying. Okay. Two, two quick questions. Um, I live three and a half miles outside of Montpelier. Our, my internet sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and every single, every single politician, that's their campaign, whether it's Christine or anybody else. We still don't have it. If I lived in Montpelier, it would be a different story. It's so frustrating. No, it would Wonderful if you live in town here <laughs> or Chittenden County. Why, you know, it's so difficult to move to a rural area. Just. Well, I'm gonna take that because I'm living in Calais and we don't have internet out there any better than you do. Um, this is a cell phone, <laughs> Janet. Have you ever heard of this? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree with you completely. And, and uh, one of the uh, issues that we looked at last year, I don't know if you all have heard about the the um, money that's being paid to people who um, are uh, do work yeah. remotely, um, you know, the, the ten, I don't know what it was, two thousand, ten thousand. Anyway, it, it made me crazy because yeah. using that money rather than using money to get internet out to the communities, it just makes no sense to me whatsoever. It gave a big national splash, but it frankly is a waste of money, um, and. You are absolutely right. If we really want to, if we want to get young families into the state, if we want to support our rural areas, um, we need to get decent internet out there, and we don't have it. We need to get cell service out there too. And all the <laughs> folks too. A quick, quick yes. question for the congressman: yeah. Does he have any interest? And the Republicans you mentioned something about federal spending or whatever. Is is he is he in favor of continuing to kick the can down the road for deficits because it's unsustainable? And for seniors and everybody else, we're going to be Greece at some point. And I would love, to, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, 20, 21, 20, and that's without all of the entitlements. It's just, it's, it's, it's a train wreck, and it's just so frustrating. So uh, um, I'll answer that, but I want to also answer your prior question. Just on the federal level, uh, one of Congressman Walsh's great hopes actually going into the new Congress is that there'll be some bipartisan support for uh, an infrastructure bill. This was something that was discussed two years ago and it didn't go anywhere, but it's something that certainly Democrats are interested in. The president has claimed he's interested in it, and so we'd like to try to find a way to move that forward. And in his view, that wouldn't just include roads, bridges, water, wastewater, infrastructure. That, that would also include broadband, because for Congressman Welsh, broadband is a part of the necessary utility infrastructure, especially for rural communities that, in a just sort of pure marketplace uh, perspective, you know, it's like rural electrification, it's not going to get done with a purely market driven solution. So, an infrastructure bill that includes rural broadband investment is something that he's very focused on and interested in, and he's a member of the Rural Broadband Caucus, which has been trying to push for this. On the deficit, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, one of Congressman Walsh's big concerns over the tax cut discussion was, in years past, there might be tax cut uh, bills, but they would at least be paid for or offset to some degree. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was completely not paid for. You know, it was just, we're gonna, you know, throw it what one point five trillion dollars, you know, added to the the deficit, and we're going to claim the sort of supply side magical thinking that will all pay for itself. That we know is a proven economic fact, like that does not work, and we've seen that from the tax cuts in the '80s. And so, I mean, you know, he certainly was in the minority at the time, but has really raised the issue and said, you know, if you're going to do this, at least try to pay for it. And that didn't happen. 
And now, um, you know, we've kind of seen the predictable results with the deficits going up and congressional Republicans saying, oh, look at these terrible deficits. We really need to crack down on entitlements now because, you know, we need to do something about the debt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. So, um, but, you know, in the kind of military spending, kind of similarly, Congressman Welch was a big supporter of having the Pentagon actually go through its first ever audit, which recently got completed, you know, to, to look at that. So, um, you know, we are, you know, we are in a difficult situation, you know, long term. Um, you know, one, one thing to note, just kind of in general, is Peter is a member of this Problem Solvers Caucus, which is a bipartisan group of, of members from both sides of the aisle to try to look at, you know, some, you know, what can we do to kind of get the kind of, fit, you know, some sense of fiscal responsibility back. And I think, you know, for Peter, certainly that means, you know, there are investments that we continue to make on the domestic side, but, you know, we can't be passing tax cuts that aren't paid for. You know, we can't be spending money, you know, on military, you know, unjustified military spending that, you know, when you look at an audit, you know, there is a significant amount of, of waste there. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's challenging, um, but it is, um, I mean, I agree, like, the bill is going to come due on that. Um, but I think, you know, certainly for Congress and Welch, you know, coming back and looking at, you know, in particular, blowing $2 trillion holes in the budget with you know, unpaid for tax cuts is something that we need to, you know, not be doing. Yeah. Um, I was going to add a broad there. Oh, you want to go? Um, just real quick on broadband. Um, we have a couple of parts of the state where community organizations have come together and they've been doing a great job, particularly down to the east here. Uh, and so figure out a way to replicate that or match some money. Uh, you know, I think it's quite clear that telephones weren't going to get to the end of the line without government involvement. That the, the capitalist system doesn't work into the lower population areas on the cost versus return. That's a terrible thing. Um, so, uh, so I think looking at that and, and also it's still my understanding from someone at Senator Sanders' office is to just put in Broadband ever in the state is about a billion dollar endeavor, right? And the state is not going to come up with that kind of money. But if the state can come up with some money that either we loan at a low interest rate that the privates pay back or that we match on a one to five ratio or something, then you start to see that kind of possibility. And uh, I'm not an expert in it. I know Christine knows more about utilities on a long shot than I do and many others. Uh, but there's what you've said and I think has been echoed here. Vermont's economic future, given our proximity to the populations of southern New England and the northeast megalopolis, is people could work here, make a good living, and could commute every third or fourth week to clients in those population centers with a two to four hour drive to meet for two days, and yet live and work and raise their families here with our safer communities, pay, with our great schools, and pay their taxes. Exactly. exactly. So there's no doubt that I think that's a huge piece of our future. The nut to crack is financing it. I happen to think we could use canvas revenue for that, but that's another matter for another day. A <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, question of, of uh, keeping people retiring in place, as, you, as it was mentioned. Energy costs and home heating are huge. For a person that's 70 or 80, looking at a 15-year payback is not going to help them much. So. Uh, if reducing those energy costs by putting up PV or whatever, or insulating their homes, we have the, the, some of the oldest housing stock in the world, I think, at least in this country. This country. And, I don't know if I say the world, but yeah. There's this stock of housing in Europe that might be old. And the, a lot of the really old homes have really old people in them. And they're, they're not going to put up an investment that's going to take many years to recover. Right? You know, it's a really good point. We've talked, to, we mentioned weatherization earlier, and that's something that's out. Obviously, we have been investing in over the years, and we'll continue to have as a priority for sure. Just, just briefly on the, on the federal side, when um, uh, the House was last controlled by Democrats, we passed uh, something called the Homes Act, which would have provided a major infusion of federal financial support in addition to state weatherization yeah. funds and what Efficiency Vermont and NeighborWorks and other organizations do. That passed the House, didn't pass the Senate, but certainly, um, I know from some of my prior work, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of well-funded programs on the electric efficiency side to help re reduce, you know, put in efficient lighting, but the home heating side is where we really need more resources. So um, we made some progress on that at the federal level when Democrats last controlled the House, and that's something we're gonna look at doing uh, in the coming Congress too, to supplement that and try to advance that more.
And one thing I, I heard this year on the campaign trail relating to LIHEAP was that the timing of LIHEAP funding uh, <laughs> makes it so that some heating is more expensive. Now, I know wood heat for a lot of seniors is difficult because moving the wood around, but still many do heat with wood. Well, if you buy a green cord of wood in June, it's $100 less than buying a dry cord of wood in January. Uh, and so there's lots of ways where, you know, I don't know whether on the federal side or on the state side, some of these timing issues can be adjusted just even to make the programs we have go farther in addition to trying to find additional resources for weatherization and front, front savings on uh, solar or other energy changes. happened this country was just stricken with fear and despair and the FDR came in and basically started a public works program with the WPA they put a lot of people to work and basically got the country back, back on it an even keel and right now there's been there's so much despair in some of the rural areas like Appalachia we're seeing the number of people dying from opiate overdoses for years more than all the people that were killed in Vietnam and like however long that war lasted I consider these, these deaths to be a, a way of getting rid of surplus labor. <laughs> so I mean, what we need is like, to really push on infrastructure, get people back to work where they can get some pride in themselves, support their families, and that's a book to drugs as a, as a way of like dealing with their pain. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Agree. I'll leave. Uh, yes. I, I'm probably one of the few people in this room. I belong to this organization, but I've never been a union member because of some disabilities I had over the years. And uh, that I was a stay-at-home mom, was divorced, and got no uh, alimony. Um, and I had to use, and I still am using uh, money from a sale of a small home to supplement my Social Security. When Medicare is taken out of my Social Security, for the last three years, I've gotten the same amount of Social Security, which is $778 a month. It's a little hard to live on that. Um, my house and my savings do help, which is more than a lot of people have. But there's no one really advocating. I think it's wonderful that the state did this, but this is more of a federal issue. They passed something a few years ago, I was told, that people who were at the lower end of Social Security wouldn't lose any money when they took more and more out for Medicare. They take more and more out. They say we have a COLA of 2.8. Well, it was 2.5 last year. And for three years, I've gotten 778. So I'm, I'm when, when they take it out. So they must be keeping me from going down because I'm so low. And, and there are a lot of folks on this level that need to be brought up. Why can't we have a real COLA? Why should we be paying so much into Medicare, just as much as wealthy people are? And wealthy people are never paying their fair share, percentage-wise, we know that. We've got, just got to listen to Bernie. And Democrats do need to be towards socialism, even though there's a big sign over in the, uh, 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 by the roundabout on right. Route 2 that says that the Democrats should be stay away from socialism <laughs> because it's a dirty word. And, and I, just, I, I, I just hope that somebody will educate the public that socialism is not a dirty word. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, sir, um, is Nancy Pelosi going to get in this year? And <laughs> <laughs> plus, plus great ball. <laughs> um, so just on your broader question first, you know, one point I think Dave, David or someone alluded to is, you know, Democrats nationally ran this election and won talking about health care. Wasn't talking about Donald Trump or impeachment or a lot of other issues. They focus like a laser uh, talking about health care, and, and in my mind that includes, um, you know, Medicaid. And so, you know, I think there's going to be a real impetus to take action on, uh, on that. It could help speak to your issue, and we talked about the COLA piece earlier. Nancy Pelosi, I don't, you know, it's, it's anyone's guess. It's, 
Uh, P Peter has not committed yet. I mean, one of the things that he has said is that the person he votes for for speaker, he wants it to be someone who will support making uh, the House a more uh, democratic institution, just in terms of having the committees have more power to actually influence what happens with uh, legislation, not just have it be something that the leadership cooks up and brings to the floor fully baked so that more people can take part and produce a better product. That has not been the case in recent years. So he hasn't committed yet, but that's been kind of his general criteria for what he's looking for. Well, can, I've, I've called and I've written to the senator, and I've get, I get form letters back that don't even address my question. He's a congressman. Okay. <laughs> I mean the congressman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Glad to talk to you after about that. By your specific. There's another question right here. Um, I want to address a housekeeping issue. Uh, there's a meeting going on in this room. There's a bathroom on this side, and there's a bathroom in the back. But that's not why I stood up. <laughs> like like uh, future Governor Zuckerman, um, <laughs> I, I, I had an idea listening to this panel. Uh, Vermont is one of three states that makes no state contribution to senior centers. Uh, the other states are Georgia and either Mississippi or Louisiana. Besides, be, be, besides uh, health and high cost of prescriptions uh, and, uh, and housing uh, and heating and the cost of, of fuel, uh, another major problem for senior centers, I mean for seniors, uh, is transportation. Uh, and my idea was, uh, perhaps, uh, we could take care of the transportation problems for seniors by setting aside uh, a small amount of grant money so that the, I, I believe we have 37 or 38 senior centers uh, in our state uh, could apply for uh, funding uh, for a vehicle or a van or a car that could be used to transport seniors within their in their communities, not only to the senior center, uh, but to do uh, grocery shopping and to doctor's appointments and to other things that they that they have. Uh, that's a that's a wild idea, but no wilder than asking seniors to join together and join housing. So uh, right, right. No, I like that. I like that. I'm happy to take that idea and bring it back to the House Transportation Committee. We've talked a lot about different models and pilots around ride shares, um, especially in rural areas. You know, could we do something that's kind of like a Vermont version of Lyft or, uh, you know, and any of those other um, apps? But then you need access to self-service. <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's a lot to work on there, but I will definitely take that idea back uh, to the house. Yep. Um, as far as the uh, people being able to remain in their homes and, and healthcare in the community thing, I want to speak to that something that affects older people potentially, but also a lot of younger people, including people that live in Montpelier. Um, we've heard healthcare, we have like a three pillar goal for healthcare, affordability, um, accessibility, and transparency. I think there's a, a fourth goal that healthcare should always include, which is that it not damage people's basic community civil rights. We have a problem in Vermont that's been ongoing since I was a teenager and a young adult. And I've experienced this, and other people have experienced this um, more severely than I have. Um, which is that in the area of emotional and mental health care, behavioral health, um, which often gets put under the umbrella of psychiatric medicine through the pharmaceutical angle, there are people that are often pressured, or in some cases compelled, and in some cases by the Vermont State Government, the Agency of Human Services, to accept certain forms of health care that are actually often very damaging to their bodies and to their brains. Um, and, and I'm speaking, I can speak very specifically toward this. Um, there are mood stabilizers that are used, anti-anxiety medications, and antipsychotics, both the older versions and the atypical antipsychotics which came into vogue and are harmful, can cause metabolic problems, can cause diabetes, prediabetes, can cause problems with mental functioning. A study in 2008 um, by Nancy Andreasen, who was the editor of the American Psychiatric Association Journal, I think it was, said that, oh, it looks like some of, some of these Antipsychotics are causing 
shrinkage of parts of people's brains, this is not just attributed, attributable to schizo a schizophrenic disease process, and schizophrenia is often kind of a, just a term that's thrown at people for various symptoms. Um, diagnoses of mood disorders and schizophrenia are often not very specific, not necessarily grounded in a lot of physio physiological information or facts or, or data about individual people, but these theories are applied on, to people it's nice if you can go and choose you know, what kind of health care you want. And usually this is the case for people. People go to the doctors, they get antidepressants, they get various medications, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics. A lot of times people get to choose. Some people sometimes don't. If they're behaving in a way where somebody's like, oh, this, this is a little odd. Um, there's a young woman from Montpelier who is a friend of mine, but I'm, I'm closer friends with her partner. And I'm not going to name names here. But it's been very, very difficult to watch um, what's been going on in, for her for years. And some people will know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to name names here. Um, from my perspective, um, it's, um, this woman has suffered immensely since adolescence, I think, by being put on this, that, and the other thing, probably not very judiciously. Um, and over the past three years, including the end of her pregnancy and the first months of her child's life, um, she has been in, was put into hospital care. Not really what she wanted or completely agreed with, to my, to my understanding. Was back out, has an apartment in Montpelier she could be in, but due to concerns about her behavior voiced by various people in the community who had encountered her, and that, or that she seemed to be looking for help. People called police saying, oh, she's looking for some help. Something's going on. Police would connect her with Washington County Mental Health. Washington County Mental Health would screen her. She'd go into Central Vermont Medical Center mm -hmm. and or up to Burlington. And now she's in the state-run facility in Middlesex, which is yeah. right near the state police barracks. It's a locked, fenced facility. And I'm not, Excuse even, me. I'm not finished with this yet. But Excuse tonight, me. Can, can you tell us how this relates to what the legislature can do? Or well, I, I, are, I think yeah. that they can fix are, that are, well, but I will see what I can do. Um, anyway, I think these things need to be followed and examined carefully. Um, I'm concerned about, I don't, I don't know what the latest is with the medication bills. There was something going on a few years ago with the medication bill. I know Senator Claire Ayer was very concerned that people be able to be medicated in a timely fashion and not be suffering states of psychosis and be without their medication or medication. <laughs> but unfortunately, <clears throat> some of these drugs are very harmful, very, and affect people in ways, you know, and to be forcibly injected with something dicey and certainly over the long term. I'm proud of my friend who I understand has been choosing to not take some of the medication that doctors have prescribed to her. I hope that she will be released soon. And the thing that I actually, the point that I wanted to get to about something that might really help is my understanding is with our local community mental health services, they're responsible for a couple of different programs and services. There are services for people who are designated as being developmentally disabled. Okay, people who are considered to have various developmental um, disabilities which some of which would have been called retardation, but that's like kind of language that's fallen by the wayside. But do you see this as you not lack of funding? funding I'm, I'm going to get to that. Okay. This is important. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so there are personal um, services provided where people have um, supportive people that can help them with behavioral things, like in community. Um, those are, I think, maybe more available when people are diagnosed with a developmental disability, such as autism, or their, you know, um, Down syndrome, or numerous other things. If those were available, if funding from Medicare and Medicaid was certainly like made to be available for people like my friend, who then could possibly be living in her apartment, which she still sure. is paying rent on, instead of having to be in a <coughs> locked, Safe facility 
way out on route. Yeah. You raised too. so many important issues <laughs> there around mental health and access to to treatment and the kind of treatment people need. And I, you know, we put investments in our state budget this year, which we're seeing getting implemented now, is putting more mental health providers out in communities and out on the streets to, to help um, be the first line of defense and be there um, to help people who are um, experiencing some type of crisis. But what, there's so much more to do. What kind of providers are you, are you talking about? Counselors. Counselors, more social workers. You know, I think what you raised so many great points about there's so much more to do in terms of housing. Um, and, in, and I think we've also seen an access to providers. I hear from my constituents a lot that the wait list to get an appointment um, it is a barrier to care. And that shouldn't be the case. So I, I take your points really well and we'll take them back to the State House. Were there any other questions? I, yeah, Jane, I don't, what's the timing? <laughs> Make sure, we're, I, see, we're, I see people we're watching us. The end, and um, unfortunately, there is another event <laughs> happening upstairs, which is, means that we're going to have to get out of here at noon, which is 15 minutes from now. Um, but what I do want to say is, the mental health area is an incredible crisis. I know everybody here understands that. And how are we going to solve it? I don't have any clue, because it's been a crisis for many years. But what I do think, and this is not a popular thought, I think Vermont is going to have to raise taxes so we get some money, so we can fund the programs that really need to be funded, because they've been neglected. Not neglected on purpose, but just because there isn't enough money to go around. Well, I would love for you to call the governor's office. <laughs> and tell them you want us to raise your taxes. Go. Oh, did you want to add? I, I do want to add to that. Um, you know, it's it's a perennial question, right? And I think both issues are true. One is there are we're the wealthiest country and the wealthiest time in history, and there are resources out there uh, that we could tap into at the state and federal level if we were to raise certain taxes. That's right. At the same time, it is important to look at where we're spending our dollars and where there are inefficiencies. Uh, one of the topics I talked about a lot this last summer and actually been talking about for a few <laughs> years when I was in the Senate, is that we provide a lot of social services to family through the Agency of Human Services <laughs> for zero through five year olds. Right. And then that cost gets shifted onto the schools for when they enter the school. Mm -hmm. And between those two budgets, we actually have a total of about 2.4 billion and about 1.7 billion. And these numbers change, so I may be off by a, uh, you know, a couple hundred million. <laughs> but uh, combined, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I brought to the governor a year and a half ago in the effort to say, under this Trump administration, why don't we show that a Republican governor and a progressive Democrat lieutenant governor mm -hmm. can actually work together on some issues Let's look at our education budget and talk to the secretary as well as the frontline workers. Let's go to the human services budget and talk to the secretary as well as frontline workers and look at where we're either overlapping services with duplication, which means you could find efficiency and save money, which could be used to expand services to others. And let's create a better continuum of service so that you don't have a family or a child that's getting support in one way for the first five or six years suddenly plunked into a new environment with new counselors, new social service providers in a new environment, but instead make that a continuum which would be much more stable for those families and for those children. Unfortunately, the governor chose not to call me back, chose not to have any of his personnel call me back, and look to work at that. But I do think that's an arena going forward that would both potentially yield resources to expand services into the community as well as address taxes in a positive way that would either free up those resources or, or you know, have a better way to use them. Uh, so I hope that's a helpful piece of what you were talking about. But that really, yes, that's exactly where I would think it should be. So I think we have time for one more question. Goldie, you've had your hand up for a while. Yeah, it's a small one, maybe a quick question. Um, there's an accumulation of evidence now that um, connects 
hearing loss and impairment with developing dementia and Alzheimer's, which is a very costly medical problem. There is a statutorily mandated committee, the Retired Employees Committee on Insurance. I happen to be the chair of that committee. And our recommendation was to supply um, support for hearing aids in the state health insurance. But of course, that never went anywhere because we were fighting desperately to maintain our basic health benefits, let alone add to it. So then the next place to look would be Medicare, which also doesn't cover hearing aids. Um, it's a really critical issue if you're looking to limit, uh, cuts, curtail medical cost increases um, for a kind of one-time purchase. Uh, it's certainly not simply an elderly problem because there are hearing impairments that develop much younger than our ages, but it's an issue that everybody just said, yeah, mm -hmm, and does nothing about. So I'm looking for some movement on that some way or another. I'm not, I'm not sure if Medicaid covers it, but I know Medicare doesn't, and I know the state employee insurance plan doesn't. I, I don't have an I don't have a uh, answer for you. I, I other than to say I think it's a, a really important issue. I didn't know about the connection to dementia, but it clearly leads to isolation, and I, and that is a, that is a very significant problem for seniors. So, um, as, as I finally got my husband to go and do a hearing test in January, so <laughs> I'll let you know the results. But um, <laughs> but it but it, it it is I mean it's it's not uncommon and it's a big problem and I think I, I'm. I'm really glad you raised it. I don't know what the answer is, but and, and I think it's not important. And inexpensive? No, they're, they're expensive. I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the test is, you I know. Mean, so even people who yeah. recognize they need it still can't get yeah. it because they can't afford it, and there's no support yeah. when they get it. Well, and so often, what may be expensive up front saves money in the long run. Right. Exactly. And that goes back to many of the discussions we have in politics in general is, you know, preventative and out of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and we can pay for it now or we can pay more for it later. And in the short term, you know, give a lollipop back uh, <laughs> mentality of, I would argue, Republican thinking, which is right now, let's give $10 back to people versus let's make an investment in our future, which I would counter is what you see up here much more of. Uh, that's the debate we regularly have. And this is just another really concrete example of penny wise, pound foolish. Just add one thing from the federal side, since you mentioned Medicare and Medicaid. Um, one thing that the congressional delegation we've all tried to do is work very closely with the state and with state legislators, but also with the uh, agency of human uh, uh, AHS on uh, waiver proposals. So Vermont is actually very good at coming up with creative ways to seek other, you know, you know, if there's a smarter upfront investment, for instance, that might reduce long-term costs. So can't speak to this issue directly, but in general, one of the things that we've tried to do is, you know, when the Vermont AHS or stakeholders come in and say, you know, is there a way we could get a, a waiver, some flexibility on this, that, you know, we certainly try to go to bat for that whenever we can. I think we are about, yeah. yeah. yeah thank you, thank so you all. Much.